So we're going to start a little by first talking about some research that Coursera has done and finding out exactly who are these students that are taking teacher professional development courses. Um, so we both wanted to celebrate and really showcase the impact that our TBD courses have had on the platform. And we also wanted to understand who are these people that are taking the courses. We were getting a sense that they might not all be teachers, but we didn't know how many were not teachers, um, who they were, why they would be motivated. Um, and we had we um, surveyed um, 10,000 TBD learners and got about 1,500 responses. And we actually, between me, Andrina, and Ja, another partnership manager, um, called and personally talked to users from Algeria, Turkey, Paraguay, Nigeria, Australia, and the US. Um, so we have a lot. Uh, it's a very global perspective. Um, so some background on the survey. We sent it, um, and we realized this is a very uh, skewed perspective, is that we sent it to about 10,000 people who had completed a teacher professional development course by the end of 2013. <coughs> um, we got about 1,500 respondents. Um, and we realized that there would be non-educators who were responding to the survey and classroom educators. And so we bifurcated the survey based on um, what uh, respondents self-selected as. So if they self-selected as teaching K through 12 or museum or after school educator, we ask them, what's the impact this has had on your career? What is the impact this has had on your students? Um, and how have you compared the quality of Coursera teacher professional development to the other <coughs> teacher professional development you're probably engaging in? And for non-educators, we were like, why are you here? Like, what motivates you to take a course that's so clearly geared at teachers? Um, and what has been the impact on your life? Um, and just as we have people in this room from Mexico, Korea, the Netherlands, and Canada, we have an incredibly global audience in our TPD courses, um, you know, top 10 countries, top 10 languages. The U.S. is still the dominant country, but we have tons of learners from all over the world. Um, so in terms of course quality, how are we doing? The good news is the majority of TPD learners would um, recommend a course to a friend or a fellow educator. The majority of TPD users said that this course met their expectations for high quality professional development. Um, in fact, 94% of educators who had taken other TPD in terms of going to a workshop, going to a conference, paying for an online course, um, taking a MOOC on another platform, felt that Coursera courses were of similar or higher quality than the other TPD they had previously experienced, whether that was online or in person. Um, in terms of the impact on educators, we found that 42% of our respondents were K-12 classroom teachers, and the other 58% weren't. So who were they? they were, there were some university and higher education professors. Um, there were tutors who did one-on-one -on -one tutoring or did English tutoring. Um, we had counselors and administrators. We had a lot of parents who wanted to better understand their children and their development. We had this whole category of other, which ended up being early childhood, um, English as second language teachers, volunteers, instructional designers, TAs, people who wanted to become teachers in the future and people who had retired from teaching but wanted to stay in the loop. Um, and so how had this really impacted these educators' teaching practice? Um, we found that we did really, really well on um, educators agreeing, this has given me great ideas for what to use in the classroom. And we have some specific quotes from teachers um, in the next slide. But what we found is that, you know, while 50, like about half of um, people agreed that it enabled to, them to connect with other educators, the other half were like, meh, I'm not so sure. And we are really curious about this. We would love to hear what you think are teachers or non-teachers in your classes um, connecting with others. Um, is that the goal that they're using to join? Should we encourage more of that? Or are we okay with some people just exploring the content and not talking to other educators? Um, so these are some quotes that we've gotten from the survey, you know, um, in terms of how have these courses affected me as a teacher? Um, you know, their confidence has increased or they feel like they've been re-energized to be a better teacher. Um, one teacher wrote this really heartwarming story about how she took several courses that helped her to emotionally connect with her students, to give them hugs. Um, this may not, probably not legal in the United States, but <laughs> in some other international country where it's fine to hug your students, um, you know, <laughs> gave them many skills which their peers did not already know. Um, about 70% of teachers agreed or strongly agreed that the courses had positively impacted their students. But what we really wanted to caveat is that um, we're not sure if te teachers admit that they don't have much data about how these courses are actually impacting their students. It's very different, 
difficult to tell. There's many confounding factors. They don't know if it's because they took a Coursera course or because they had a conversation with another teacher or they you know, took another um, example of TBD. But what we do know is that teachers do feel that it has positively impacted them as a teacher. And we hope that correlates to positively impacting their students. Um, Another interesting thing we found, as you noted from the keynote speech, uh, speech today, signature track students are more likely to complete courses. We asked them why. Um, I thought they were very honest. They chose the top two reasons being to motivate myself to complete the course and to obtain professional development credit for my school, district, university, or other institution. We really wanted to know this is great that teachers are able to get PD credit, but we want to know more about it. How are they getting that credit? Who are these um, people? So we talked to people across the world um, so we, had, we talked to Kevin, he's a university student at the University of Queensland in Australia. He's finishing a, a BA in environmental management and his like, dream career in the future is to teach environmental studies um, to secondary school students and he has been using those verified certificates to get um, professional development hours for his vocational training at the University of Queensland. Um, we talked to Maria, she's an English language teacher in Paraguay who has actually been using TBD courses not only for herself, but her, for her students. So she explained she's using the art inquiry course um, to both teach her students about art and help them engage in art, but also to slowly teach them English. She goes through the courses um, when they come out and she collects a list of vocabulary. She teaches her students the vocabulary and then goes through the course with them so that they're both learning English and also getting to engage with another subject. Um, and as Daphne mentioned during the keynote, we are, Coursera as a company is really thinking about greater flexibility and greater access to content. And this is something Maria said that really emphasized, uh, that I really remembered is that she was like, you know, like an English, like an English native speaker could finish this course in like two, three months, but it would be great to have that greater flexibility and that greater availability for many, the many different students in our global audience that are thinking about taking these courses. Um, and then we had, we spoke to several teachers in the United States who were able to successfully submit their statements of accomplishment or verified certificates to earn PD credits in their school districts. Um, they've been able to spread this as a ripple effect by teaching other teachers that they work with. Um, they would love to, you know, be recognized for their work um, on Coursera. We've talked to other teachers who have been able to submit those certificates in order to get pay increases at their job which is one of our goals is to help people advance their lives and their careers. Um, so I talked about these 42% of educators, but who are these other 58% who are mysteriously coming to our teacher professional development classes? Um, we have parents who want to understand the educational development of their children. We have people who just want to teach skills to others. Um, we have people who are educational designers or who are principals that want to support teachers they know. Um, and so, so we asked them, why do you take these courses? And many of them want to learn more about teaching and education. They want to support the children they interact with. They want to prepare to be teachers in the future. Um, so I think that really segues into our discussion from our three panelists, or sorry, our three workshop leaders um, about you know, their personal experiences in the courses and why, how we can, what we can do to foster communities of professional practice, both focusing on the teachers that we're targeted at and also this very wide population that is not, are not professional educators. Questions? Cool, so uh, I'm gonna outline, so you have, a, you have a workshop being led by three New Yorkers who couldn't agree on what train to take, so we all came to, uh, <laughs> we came to London to sort that out. Um, should have been the F, should have been the F. Um, and I'm going to speak for a few minutes about what we're going to call the opportunity, um, but it certainly has a, a challenge as well. And I want to frame it um, with, with this quote from the U.S. Secretary of Ed, Arne Duncan, especially the part in blue at the bottom, America's university-based teacher education programs need revolutionary change. And I hope that as we're talking through uh, during our presentation and the questions that follow, I mean, the, the, the medium is a revolution. Um, I don't, I think it can exacerbate the same problems to which he's referring there. So it's not just a question of uh, the medium to get the information out, but it's how we make use of that. Um, so just for a little context, Relay is a very new graduate school of education. Current state, we're in three states, uh, New York, New Jersey, and now we have a campus in New Orleans and Louisiana. We have about 1,000 students total. We're opening in Chicago and Texas next year. Um, and yes, uh, there we go. And all of our students are full-time teachers. So it's the equivalent of night school, except we have a blended curriculum with about 45% of the content online. So Amelia, 
Uh, I used to film her class, uh, used to teach in Newark and when she was in the program, and then she was also obviously a student in the program. So if you're a, um, a part-time, uh, like in a typical teacher ed program, you would be teaching part-time. That doesn't work here. Um, so the revolutionary change that we've thought about it so far at Relay is that we've broken up our core content we have lots of opportunities for practice and feedback, and then we have authentic assessments. We've basically taken our blended online content and made it from the core, the direct instruction, the readings, um, the pieces where basically the transfer of information, we've moved that largely online. And we've, it's more interesting discussion in many respects to talk about what we've intentionally left in a brick and mortar environment, which has been the opportunities to engage with colleagues, to stand up in front of a room, to practice how you're going to start your lesson on, on you know, uh, teaching phonics to your second graders or whatever it is. We put a great deal of emphasis on that practice and feedback. In many respects, we think that's the revolutionary change to which the secretary is referring, that, that good teaching is a skill that can be learned, but there's a big uh, get it, do it gap, to, to quote something from a, a Doug Lamov, one of our colleagues who wrote that book, Practice Perfect, that, that I can intellectually understand the content, but getting up and doing it in front of 25 second graders is a whole other thing because I haven't built the muscle memory. We have left this in a room so far, and then the authentic assessments, instead of writing essays about um, what it would be like to teach this class, because we have full-time students, uh, full-time teachers as our students, that we ask them to record their lessons and showing that they're integrating a particular technique and then bring it back in. So number two and number three are challenging in a MOOC environment. Um, you, can, you can imagine why. Uh, don't have a roster that you can um, believe in. Um, and so it's hard to create collaborative work environments, at least so far it's been a challenge for us. Um, I'm standing up here as someone who's trying to get it right, not in, as an expert. And then the authentic assessments, it's when you have 100% um, of the people are full-time teachers that have access to cameras, you can make an authentic assessment that asks them to go teach phonics at that second grade classroom. But it's more challenging and there's certainly opportunities when the folks are not uh, necessarily in the classroom. Um, so here are my doodles. So like I just said, that it was, it was generally pretty simple for us to, to move what that, the, the uh, core content into video lectures, and in and, and, and many respects we have. Uh, more challenging, oh, and, and so this was the one teaching character, uh, teaching character is the one MOOC that we've so far built out. And when I went, it was, it was born as a two-day uh, PD session. And so when I went last June to take notes to figure out how, what parts I was going to record and turn into a MOOC, um, what I found was <laughs> um, 150 educators holding hands and singing um, Lift Every Voice and Sing, um, uh, doing a lot of collaborative learning, um, uh, doing, taking a lot of time to reflect and like, like introspection and, and, and pretty heavy you know, a review of their own lesson plans, what have you. And I couldn't figure out how to transfer that experience to the online environment, to the, the lectures. Because um, in many respects, this was about, um, it's a baseball analogy, sorry. Um, go Dodgers. Uh, but, but it is about taking swings at, that's a rubric in the, in the outfield, of course. It's obvious, <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's taking swings and getting the attempts to stand up in front of a room and do the practice that, that in many teacher ed programs is missing. It's a, I get it, but the, to actually do it is more challenging. Um, it would be simple for Relay to transfer the videos we've already built for our blended learning and make MOOCs out of those, but that would only be telling about 45% of the story. The other half or more is about building out uh, true, meaningful opportunities to practice. Um, and I'll show you what we've done. Um, how do I flip over to that, to the, yeah, to the page, thanks. Um, so what we just did is we tried to separate out uh, in, in the teaching character MOOC um, mastery learning from a more constructivist approach. So what you have, thank you, is, let's see if I do this right. Yeah. So we built out uh, on the, the top, in the watch section, these are the direct instruction videos. All the quizzes, all the peer reviews, everything was built from the, the content that came from here. So this is your typical, you know, there's a lecture and we hope it was good. Um, the, this is the get it. This is the part where it's like, okay, this is objective mastery. But um, anyone who tells you that they are an expert in self-control and that they've truly mastered that objective or gratitude is, um, probably doesn't have much self-control. So we wanted to give them opportunities to really practice the content. 
And so we created these pieces here in the engage section, which is going to tell you like if you clicked on three good things, it would say write, uh, spend a couple evenings um, writing down a reflection of what you're grateful for, uh, come back to the forums and tell us about it, and we would have a dedicated discussion forum. And this was the place where totally voluntary, you didn't have to touch any of these to, to get credit for the course. We were hoping that this would be the, the place where people would start to engage and try to stand up and, and, and get at the do it part of the, of the course. Um, uh, get it at the top objective mastery, a more constructivist, live the learning through the engage section. But um, that's, that's what we, and I'll tell you how it went uh, here. Oh, sorry. Just in case you forgot what he said earlier. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, just, just to close this out, I mean, I think, I think we, pa we made a goal that we were going to have 10% uh, complete the course, pass the course. We had 13%, so I guess, I guess, we, I guess we got it. Um, the challenging part is to figure out, are our teachers prepared to integrate character, or are our students prepared to integrate character, and how can we tell? We don't feel like we have truly measurable quantifiers for uh, the sorts of engaging activities that we feel really make the difference and are the revolutionary change. It's not about just comprehending, it's about practicing. And um, given that we don't have a place where we can rely on a student roster, our de facto approach would be to have group work and to have collaboration. But how do you facilitate that collaboration uh, in a world where some people are there one day, some people aren't, some people are downloading the materials to use at their school and aren't interested in the course? Um, it's the question that I want to leave us with and then hopefully it'll, it'll queue up the next two presenters and something we can talk about. Yes? Yeah. Baton pets? Cool. Cool. Uh, yeah, well, we can open up questions. She has to change uh, her deck out. Is there, are there any yeah. quick questions or anything I didn't clearly convey first? The prompts? Yeah. Uh, the prompts would ask you to do something like, um, uh, we wanted you to get into a growth mindset and experience failing at something. So we put up videos of people learning how to tie bow ties and said, can you tie a bow tie? Try it, monitor your experience getting frustrated, come back to the forum and tell us about it. Uh, peop some people took pictures, but most of it was uh, some sort of expository writing back. Like, oh, this was really hard. I realized that you really slipped through a fixed mindset and a growth mindset all the time, that kind of thing. No. It's, at least the way I created this so far, I don't know what a barometer of success would have been in that environment. Um, I asked every student to make five responses um, in any discussion forum, but if you put an exclamation point in five, response, in five places, you got credit. Um, yeah. Brian? Um, first, just public kudos for a great course. Uh, I think those of us who took it were really impressed with what you all did. And Thanks. You I'm curious, I think your goal of can they actually do this when they go to the classroom is the right question to ask. Anecdotally, was there anything that the platform allowed you to see where a student demonstrated that? Were there video uploaded, even just a couple promising things that emerged? Like we yes. Try to yeah, um, and in fact, it makes us wonder about what a two-point, you know, like a two-on-one course would be. Um, some of the, I mean, we're just still digging through the data, but there's a card game in particular. Someone created a, a grit card game, which is basically uh, bullshit, um, where you're supposed to have, uh, tell us about a time where you were really gritty, and um, there's a prompt, and you're either going to, in real life, maybe you never were gritty, and so you just make something up, and someone can call BS on you and get a point, and there's this kind of fun back and forth. Um, I think there are lots of opportunities to then take that content and, and either workshop how you would teach it in a, in a classroom or go do it and film it and then come back and discuss it. Um, but we are still just, I mean, there's just 1,800 submissions, and I haven't figured out a way to get through them all yet. Maybe we could hold the other questions till the end, and then because and then, I don't want to take too much time. Um, so hi everybody, once again I'm Lisa Mazzola and I work at the Museum of Modern Art, um, which if you don't know it's in New York City, it's in Midtown in New York City and we have um, a collection of modern and contemporary art. Um, and so last spring when we um, became part of the, the teacher professional development portal, um, my colleague Deb Howes and I went to Philadelphia and because I work in teacher programs I was you know, the person that was, was asked to work on this project. Um, what you see here is flashing forward a year to, um, on the right-hand side, it's the first MOOC that we launched, which actually is 
closing right now. We're in evaluation phase right now. And on the, called Art and Inquiry, Museum Teaching Strategies for Your Classroom. So this was the second run. We launched it in July, and it just is running now. And then on the left, um, this coming July, we're um, launching our second MOOC, um, Art and Activity. So the really great thing is you'll also see my two colleagues, Jessica Baldenhofer and Stephanie Powell, have joined the MOOC team, which I welcome, because it's, it's great to have more folks involved. So just to give you a little bit of information um, about the museum, so we're not um, an institute of higher learning. Um, we kind of live in the sphere more of informal learning. Um, we've had on-site teacher programs for a very long time, and that's really what my job has been. This is a, an image of some teachers working in the galleries um, around a work of art by Martin Kippenberger. And just to give you a little bit about our pedagogy, it's very much, um, you know, it's inquiry-based, it's very much based in constructivist learning, it's all about participatory, um, you know, involvement and engagement, and also practice is a huge thing, like Dan talking about practice, that's a huge part of it. Um, and actually something we've often even struggled with on-site in terms of like working with teachers even over time, like giving them a chance to really you know, implement our strategy. So we do um, a lot of modeling on site. So it's, it's very, very interactive. It's never anybody sort of standing in front of anyone um, and, and giving a lecture. It's very much what we do with students in the gallery. So it's really student-centered student, student -centered learning. Um, okay. So leads to me and my questions after I, I took the train back to uh, New York from Philadelphia. Um, and, you know, it was interesting because I, it was a little bit antithetical, the idea of the MOOC. Um, as my colleague Mary said, we've had online courses for adults at the museum, um, asynchronous and, well, they're all asynchronous, but some of them are um, you know, instructor-led and some of them are self-guided. Um, so the, the good thing was that was already happening. Um, I had dabbled a little bit with, with online synchronous teacher professional development in 2009, but it wasn't 17,000 students, which we had in the first round of Art and Inquiry, it was 15 students. Um, so, you know, my head was, was a little bit jumbled, um, and so I landed here. Um, the other thing that's sort of interesting about, um, you know, Maria and I and, uh, and her colleagues as well, um, we were two of the first, you know, museums to be in the portal. So again, it was sort of like, well, we're the museums, and, you know, what is our place in all of this? And I have to admit, suddenly I felt a bit of pressure um, thinking, wow, this is, this is, this is big stuff. So um, the first thing I did was just think, well, what is this, you know, topic that I want to, that I want to work with? And it was a pretty broad topic, art and inquiry, but it's really foundational to what we do. So I knew that's what we wanted to do. And then I arrived back at that question of thinking about what we do on site, knowing that I couldn't replicate it online, pulling out those core pieces, um, the things that I really, you know, wanted to be there, the idea of the engagement, um, you know, how do we create an experience that allows for people to share experiences and feedback. Um, so I started to delve a little bit deeper and, you know, just kind of arriving at this kind of critical question, how do we create an environment that allows students to exchange, engage, and practice. So I started to look more deeply at each of these things. Um, you know, and I think we all, you know, it's just good teaching, right? I say that all the time to my teachers when they come to professional development. They have the hardest job in the planet and I'm just you know, here to give them more of a resource and, and more tools to do what they do. And I'll often say to them, a lot of the engagement strategies we're teaching you in our museum-based teaching strategy practices are exactly what you're already doing in the classroom. So, um, but it is really important, just like when students are engaged, they learn, it was really important, obviously, that the teachers needed to be engaged in whatever we would build. So again, this idea of practice. So how are we gonna get them activated? Um, how are we gonna motivate them to wanna actually try things and go out and do things? So again, that was one of the other critical things in my mind. They have to engage, they have to practice. And then the idea of exchange. So teachers always um, tell me, and I'm sure a lot of you hear this, that you know, they're often working in isolation and it's really challenging for them and they need um, and, and thrive on professional development opportunities, let them not only exchange with each other, but they get to meet new people from different backgrounds. And so that's something that um, I knew had to be really important too. So, you know, how would, we, how would we foster that? So before I get into sort of just an overview of some of the things we did in our course, you know, this is our data from the first run of the course, so um, we had 60%, 66% that were international um, enrollees from over 100 countries. 60% um, was our teacher ratio for the, for the first MOOC. Um, and this is just the breakdown of the discipline. So the highest being art studio and art history, and then sort of tied social studies, English, 
um, in literature, which is kind of typical for our on-site professional development, although I'd have to say English and literature and social studies are actually probably a little bit closer to, to Art Studio, but similar, and then we um, have some math and sciences as well. And then here's just a little word cloud of the non-teachers to give you a sense of, of who was in there. So, you know, people from, you know, art backgrounds and design backgrounds, but there was also social workers and, um, you know, people who retired, people working in account executives and communications and engineering. So that's just a little, little profile. Um, so then here we are at the course page. So, you know, I think that most of you, I won't go into sort of all the details of the courses because you guys in the room, even if you haven't built your MOOC yet, you, you know about all the options and the, and the kind of things that you can, you can come up with. So um, obviously we had you know, lecture videos, we definitely had that. Um, we had quizzes, we had a peer uh, graded assessment, which I'll talk about more in a, in a minute. Um, the course was four weeks. Um, and so you know, in terms of the content, it was, it was um, I wouldn't say traditional or typical, because I don't think there is any typical MOOC content, but I think it you know, probably along the same lines from what you guys are thinking. In terms of the lecture video, and I won't show you a video now just because we don't have time, it was um, sort of a blend of modeling and also kind of um, lecture. So it wasn't really you know, me sort of standing there. It was more like talking about something through sort of imagery and then modeling that by using footage of students um, and teachers working in MoMA's galleries. So that leads to the idea of the communities of learning. So, you know, as I said, you know, teachers are always telling us that they want more time to work collaboratively and to exchange with each other. So this was sort of the first area. And I remember when I had the conversation with Andrena, one of 10,000 conversations, she should have called it the bat phone because she was like constantly there for me, the email bat phone. Um, you know, and, and, you know, as Dan just said, I asked Andrena, like, well, I want to make them have, you know, participate in the discussion forum. It has to be part of the grade. So, you know, can I do that? And she's like, well, you can do that. But as Dan said, even if they just post, like, an exclamation point, that's going to count as, you know, they've done something. Um, so what was crucial to do was just build into the course and outline very explicitly in the syllabus that discussion forum posting about the prompts and the practice techniques and assignments we gave each week was required. So I just kept saying it over and over again. This is about your learning. This is about you coming together. You are only going to get the most out of this if you actually do these things. So kind of setting up that expectation, not saying, I know that if you only put an exclamation point, you're going to get a, you know, you're going to get a credit, um, but just sort of building it in that this is what you have to do. So each week there was a lecture video. There was a series of readings. There would be a quiz, and then there would be a required discussion forum prompt um, that would be based on the content that they would have to go out and execute on. There was also the teacher's lounge discussion forum, which was not required, which I'll also talk, talk about in a minute. Um, so, you know, my baseball reference, and I didn't do a slide, is Field of Dreams. If you build it, they will come. And so I was really pleasantly surprised when the discussion forum started lighting up pretty much right away. Um, and there are way too many posts to really talk about, but this was a really interesting one. Um, actually, a former colleague of mine, he didn't tell me he was taking the MOOC. He's actually a museum educator from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, and he, and he decided to take the MOOC. He does a lot of online learning at USHMM, and this was a great thread that got started with social studies teachers talking specifically about, because we were talking about art, and I told them, but of course, these strategies can be used with any object, so then they started um, a sub-thread of how you can use historical objects, and then it led specifically to these objects from the Holocaust. And so David posted a very common object that they teach from from that collection that I actually know well, and then he posted some of the questions he would ask about this object. Um, so you know, one of the things that we wouldn't have necessarily expected to happen, so there was the regular forum posting of people um, doing things that were obviously you know, very much about art. That was a big part of it, and we, we wanted it to be about art. We weren't anti it being, you know, other, you know, just about that. Um, we were glad to see that, but we were also glad to see stuff like this. Um, so here's just another example from the discussion forum of, of things that I wouldn't necessarily have predicted or expected. Um, and this was a specific thread in the discussion forum of medical school professors um, specifically posting about how they use inquiry-based teaching strategies or these inquiry-based teaching strategies with their medical students. Um, they even posted images. This is an example of a medical um, professional 
um, who posted an image um, of an, or a posting of an image of an object they use often. Um, we also have another um, doctor from South Africa who continues to email me, and it's actually kind of amazing because he started off with, you know, I use strategies for teaching my medical students, and then, and this was when he was taking the course, and then um, recently he said, I just want you to know that I'm actually now using the inquiry techniques when I talk to patients, and it's more of like a diagnostic thing, like in, engaging them in the process, not just this is what you're going to do for your treatment. What do you think about what I've just outlined to you? How does this relate to your lifestyle? Is this something that you know, you could integrate easily. So another kind of cool, interesting thing that happened. Um, again, just people were required to post. So this is someone's posting from one of the weeks when we started talking about inquiry as, um, activities as a form of inquiry. So, you know, dialogue-based things, but also like actual activities you can do with your students. And then this is an example of um, another posting about someone's practice, but we had a series of students who had created blogs based on their experience. So they would post in the discussion forum, but then they would use our, our hashtag. We had an art inquiry hashtag. So then they would tweet their blog posts about the content. So it was really great. There was this sort of cross thing happening. And recently, there's been all this activity on the hashtag again because we ran the course again. So all those former students are kind of reblogging re or reposting. So it was fun to start to incorporate our social media strategy and see how we could cultivate um, interaction using that. Um, the Greek study group, all in Greek. So they formed their own learning community. I mean, I'm telling you, go Greece. And one of our interns, who's Greek, um, started to translate for me. And they are, in fact, talking about um, course content. <laughs> so that was great. Um, but again, I wouldn't have known. All of a sudden, I clicked on it one day. And I'm like, there is an entire sub-thread in Greek. So I think that's you know, totally great. Yay for them. Um, so then the final assignment. So their final assignment was a peer assessment, and this is just a screenshot of someone's final project, which was then shared out to the discussion forum. The really great thing is we all, they all, including me, have access to these lesson plans. So now people can just go in there whenever they want in perpetuity or sort of indefinitely and, and pull things out. So instead of having one project that you worked on, you could have all of the projects that um, people posted. Um, just quickly, we had resources that we used. This is um, a, a website um, that we have. This is another sort of labor of love project of mine and, and my colleagues at the museum, the MoMA Learning Site. So we always had this hub, kind of, that we could send people back to for resources. We also pulled out other resources from other sites. But in terms of, like, if you want to know about our content specifically, here's where you can go. So it was a feature. Um, the other really important thing, we did want to engage with students in real time, so we used Google Hangout on Air during the course the first time. And again, thanks to Andrena and the many connections via Coursera. Um, the one on the left is the first Google Hangout we did. Um, and actually, that was before the questions feature. I don't know if you guys know the questions feature in Google Hangout. Basically, anybody, not just 10 people, can watch and post a question. It could be like thousands of people doing that. So basically, when we were running it, um, Andrena connected us with Google folks who then gave us um, sort of behind the scenes access to the beta version of the questions app. So we actually did a hangout with the questions app, which was great. So I was there, and my colleague Stephanie Powell was producing, and she was just feeding me the questions. And then on the right-hand side, this is the one we just did, and I actually sampled this time. We did the questions feature again, but then I brought in Laurel Schmidt, who is a, a writer and educator whose work was in the course, who students loved. So I decided, well, let's bring her in to the Google Hangout and let them hear from Laurel directly. Um, so that was really a really great thing to do. So then what we also did is then posted the archived link into the course page. So we had 200 and someone, some people watching in real time each time, and then thousands. I checked today. This one had 2,800 views after. So um, again, just social media. So this is an, a, a, an example of the Twitter feed. Um, and it's been great to just see people, you know, continuing to post on Twitter and to talk about their experiences pre, during, and post. Um, again, this is just an example of a woman who created a whole blog for the course um, and continued to blog thereafter. Um, Facebook, so the Art and Inquiry folks created a Facebook <coughs> group. That's on the right. And then on the MoMA K-12 through Facebook page, you can see on the left the long line of all the countries who just started the course saying, saying, hey, we're happy to be here. So just quickly, some stats. Um, I know today Daphne said 5%. So Dan beat us. You had <laughs> better completion rate. I was all proud of ours until Dan presented. No, it's awesome. It's good. We'll have a little competition in the room. The starting date, you know, the metric is very different. Yeah. 
Um, and now I will change that to 5% for my next presentation. Um, so again, but just similar to what Melanie was presenting in the overall stats, 85% said it met or exceeded expectations. Um, well, I don't have to read them. You can actually read them. Um, but I thought that was really great. We were really happy to see that. And again, I have no idea, like when you talk about measures of success, I'm still thinking about all this, but this was, you know, we, we received a lot of positive, you know, feedback and that was great, so. Um, and then this is just some quotes that, that we got from people um, who took the course. So, you know, again, we're, we're continuing to sort of look at all this and, and think about it as we move forward with the, with the next course that we're currently, currently building. Um, and there it is, there's a video, still, still of a video shoot. I would have never known that like, I would be in this position, this whole video position, which is kind of like, it's a little bit, a little bit scary. Um, but just a quick anecdotal story, this same week, I was walking around MoMA's galleries, um, and a visitor came up to me in the Gauguin exhibition and grabbed my arm and went, I feel like I just saw a celebrity, and I'm like, who's here? <laughs> because there's always celebrities at MoMA. She's like, you, you're my MOOC instructor. <laughs> so anyway. I think, yeah, I'm oh, sorry. So a comment yeah. and a question. Yeah. Comment props to you for actually thinking about the background for your hangout. Yes, <laughs> I did. Because I'm like, I would do a hangout with this body. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. about ensuring quality and the interactions. Mm -hmm. Can I refer to it? And you refer to it. Now, one thing that we can do so that there's a, a kind of baseline rigor, at least accountability, you must post. And data can show whether you posted or not, be it a, some type of punctuation or, or otherwise. But I'm wondering if either of you, or rather Marie as well, or others in the room, have been able to successfully tackle the scaling issue so that you actually are attending to and requiring students who want to get a certificate of completion, that not that, that they merely post, but that they post um, 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 in a way that meets certain criteria of, uh, of the level of discourse. So um, I'll take that. Yeah, yeah. So, so we've done that at the museum um, within our Earth course. Mm -hmm. uh, because we didn't want to risk having people just submit exclamation points as a forum post. And so for that assignment, it's a two-part assignment. In part one, we have people go out into their local area and take pictures of a geologic feature that interests them. We have them post a picture of that in the forum and write a description of it. And then part two of the assignment is writing a written analysis of that feature and talking about um, some of the more scientific geologic aspects of it. Um, this works really well in a small scale course and we had trouble thinking about how we would open it up to thousands and give credit for the forum post which mm. was key to us. So what we did is we had people post their pictures and their descriptions in the forum and then for the written assignment the very first step was paste a link to your forum post mm. and then write your uh, assessment of that geologic feature and then we have a corresponding rubric point for that forum post. Mm -hmm. So when you're a student and you're reviewing three of your peers' essays, the first thing you're asked is, did you review this forum post? Was it there? Was it good? And then you award points based on that. So we do have at least three people going and reading everybody's forum post and assessing that. So that's our sort of workaround until there's a better system, mm -hmm. until you can sort of give a grade based on qualitative work outside of the assignment in Coursera. And it worked really well. Um, that's so. a good idea. Is there other ways that people do this, like that to bring in the, the qualitative or, or use different students for the qualitative component? I mean, Maria's method is like super duper in that you're really like forcing like, we didn't go to that level because we didn't require that second piece, but we did ask people to like upload images of the objects that they were going to be practicing with each week. We did have a couple of people who posted links to videos where they actually had conversations. Some included a transcript of the conversation that they had around objects, because one week it was that you had to go out and take your chosen object and actually lead a conversation with one or more people. Um, so we did have some video and we did have some images, but that, you know, and again, it's like, at the time, my brain couldn't work in that way, but I think that's, that's, 
that's a great idea. Um, <laughs> but, it's, but it's that extra step. I mean, obviously, it's like then you have to, and, it, and, it, and it, it reminds me of, I don't know if it was Andrew or Daphne's comment about kind of it forcing your hand to be put more yeah. into the, the rigor of yeah. the practice. So. And I'm happy to talk to anybody offline if they want information about how we actually did that so yeah. you can try it yourselves. I'll be, I'll be there in that conversation. <laughs> okay. uh, so I know we're pressed for time, and I want to leave time for questions. So I'm going to take you through these slides kind of quickly. But if there's something you want me to linger on, uh, just raise your hand and let me know, and I'm happy to do that. Uh, at the Museum of Natural History, we've been spending a lot of time thinking about engagement and assessment. And I don't mean student assessment, how well are students doing on quizzes and assignments. I mean course assessment. Are we meeting our objectives as an institution, as a group? Are students getting out of our courses what we hope that they will? So that's what I mean by assessment. Uh, I mentioned we have three MOOCs, Genetics, uh, The Dynamic Earth, and Evolution. And we launched them in September, October, and November of 2013, and live to tell about it. <laughs> and you will notice that every single course includes a colon and then a course for educators. And we thought we were being clear. <laughs> <laughs> but 58% of our survey respondents are not educators. So it's, it's par for the course, it seems, in the, in the TPD portal, that you are casting a wide net and catching lots of teachers and catching lots of other people as well. But that's OK. Um, so Rob mentioned when he introduced himself that the museum has a longstanding online professional development program for teachers called Seminars on Science. It is uh, more than a decade old at this point. We have 13 courses in our pro portfolio. The courses are um, six-week online courses. They are graduate level, and they are geared towards science educators. Um, so we had a pretty good foot in this world uh, before MOOCs came along, and we're pretty well positioned to leverage that experience in this new MOOC environment. So we used a lot of different things to blend content and practice, and we pulled our material from a lot of sources. Um, one big source for us was, in fact, those seminars on science courses. So we did draw a lot of resources um, from those three courses that we have. On the content side, we have videos, essays, which at the time we built these courses was pretty unusual for Coursera. It was, a, it was video land when we, when we were developing. And I don't think that's the case anymore. I think a lot of people now are using essays. And so we were glad to push that envelope a little bit. Um, videos are both newly shot and pulled from existing material, both from seminars on science and from our science bulletins program um, and from other uh, museum sources as well. They are four-week courses, and we have a weekly quiz at the end of each week. And we have two instructors in every course. One is a scientist representing sort of the content side, the, the science side of things. And then we also have um, an educator in the course teaching. Uh, Dave Randall over here co-taught uh, the evolution course and our genetics course. Uh, and then on the practice side, we also have videos. So he did very um, pedagogy-specific videos. Um, and we have a, a written assignment in every course. And all of the assignments were designed so that teachers could model assignments that they could use with their own teacher, with their own students, excuse me. So that's sort of an opportunity for practice there. And we also provided a whole lot of uh, classroom resources for teachers in a separate section. So you can't see this clearly, and that's OK. I, it'll make my point. On the left, we have a list of forum posts. On the right, we have a single forum post broken out into all of its threads. This is a screenshot from our Seminars on Science course. This kind of engagement is fairly easy to assess. We have an extremely facilitated course with about 15 to 25 students. They have to post. It's 40% of their grade. It's a give and take between the students and the instructor and the scientist in a Seminars on Science course every week. So it's pretty easy to suss out who's engaged and who's not. Very different when you have 15,000 people and no one to keep tabs on them. So we started to think about engagement differently at the museum. And we have what we call the funnel effect, which is how we've started to describe this phenomenon to ourselves. So on the left, you see um, basic statistics. Total enrolled enrollment at its peak, because enrollment was open throughout the length of the course for us. Uh, enrollment when the courses end and peak active users. This is cumulative data for all three of our courses. I, in a perfect world, I think we would only be talking about active users. Maybe, maybe we will at the next conference next year. I think when we talk about enrolled users, um, it's a little tricky. Um, so I like to think about our active users. 
And from those active users, I like to think about them in terms of the engagement you see on the right. So again, this is across all three courses. We notice that people come in and they watch a lot of video or they download a lot of video. That's the thing they're doing the most. After that, they're reading our essays. And then they're taking quizzes. And then they're posting and commenting in the forums. And then they're submitting assignments. And then at the very bottom, we have our signature track people. So it's this funnel of engagement that goes down. And it's consistent across all three of our courses and has been so far. So um, this is how we're starting to wrestle with what does engagement look like in a MOOC. Um, it's not that we're not concerned with completion rate, but we think that completion rate just doesn't tell the whole story. So I mentioned that 58% of our um, students aren't teachers. And they're not. Um, they're consistent with the numbers that Melanie showed. We have 42% of survey respondents are educators, 26% self-identified as students, and then the others are retired or other. And then here's the level of experience that our teachers have in our, uh, in our MOOCs. So we have a, a fair amount of um, rookie teachers, you know, pre-service to three to five. And then we also have a good, a good chunk of um, veteran teachers as well. So it's nice to see this mixture. When thinking about course assessment for us, um, we were really interested in trying to find why people were taking our courses. What's their intention? What's their motivation? So the way we did this is we asked them questions on surveys. So we do a pre-course survey the week the course opens, and we do a post-course survey at the end to try to get at some of this information. We are continuing to refine our questions, so they change every time we offer a course, but we have a pretty good basis for comparison. We know that most of our respondents are taking a course to get knowledge, to access material. Some of them are earning PD credit. Many of them are not taking a course to connect with each other in the forum. And I know that's different, uh, a different experience than many of you have. Um, but for us, this quote sort of captures it. Um, I love the course, but I'm not participating in quizzes or assignments. I'm here for the essays. And so that's sort of um, what we're looking for, is how people are engaging with our content and how you can find that information out. These are the numbers for the evolution course. These are just numbers that we track for ourselves. You can see that the overall completion rate is low. You know, who earned a certificate? Um, and that's OK. It's consistent with what others experience. The number I really like is the last one, because it shows that people who are committed enough to doing an assignment, there's a pretty good chance they're going to go on to earn a certificate. So those are, that's the group of people we're looking at. And we know who they are by the second week of the course. So we have a pretty good sense of, of how many people will be completing a course. So outcomes, what are some of our outcomes in terms of content? Uh, for our evolution course, students created a Facebook group. One of our quizzes had pictures of evolutionary trees, and we asked them questions um, about it. And students couldn't get this one question right. So one of them posted a picture and said, this is the one I'm struggling with. Can you help me understand this better? And another student took that same picture, <coughs> annotated it, described her annotations, and reposted it. So all the red marks you see are not ours. Those are from the student who went in and was trying to help somebody else. So that's an outcome for, for us, seeing people engage with our content. This is another big uh, outcome for us, but it falls on the practice side. So from our survey, what material do you plan to use in your own teaching? And we list our essays, videos, our assignment, and our classroom resources. And this is the number we're really paying attention to. We want to know how people are going to engage with our material in their own classrooms. And we plan to follow up with these people six months after the course ends to see if they've done that, because it's still too soon at this point to ask them. And uh, we'll be starting that for our genetics course this, this April. So we're excited about that. Two more quick slides, and then I'll, uh, I'll turn it over for questions. Um, this is a question we got in the forum, and we get it frequently. Can I have permission to use so-and-so's article in my classroom? This is um, a really good sign to us that people are taking what we're putting out there and using it. So that's a measure of um, institutional success on the assessment side for us. What was the answer to that question? Yeah, can you say yes? Oh, of course, yes. We have, yes, we have, all the time. We absolutely did, yes. Sorry, I should have said that. Um, I lied, two more slides now. Um, so I told you about um, the Earth course. We asked teachers to go out, observe a local geologic feature, take a picture. Um, this was an email to Dr. Kinsler. She co-taught the Earth course. She, the Earth course ran in October. She got this email in November. Um, she was planning to take her students to the museum. 
Instead, she was motivated to take them to Central Park instead to do some field observations. So again, this is sort of um, the feedback we look for to show that we're, we're meeting these, um, these measures of success that we have. And then lastly, here's this follow-up email that this teacher sent to Dr. Kinsler. So not too, many, uh, too much time left for questions, but, but there are a few, and I know I'm sure we're happy to stay and answer any if you have them. Um, so I, I turn it over to you now.